lecture for chapter two on the tree of life. In this chapter, we're going to talk about some very broad, yet also very basic um, underlying concepts in evolutionary theory. Um, for example, we're going to talk about speciation, the process whereby one ancestral species splits to make two or more descendant species. Um, we're going to talk about reconstructing evolutionary histories, what we call phylogenies, and, and various other things like that. So, first of all, let's talk about what we call macroevolution. So, macroevolution. Macroevolution is widely recognized as the process um, through which new species are produced. Okay, so we're talking about large scale evolution here not small-scale changes from one generation to the next, but adding up all those small-scale changes, what we call microevolution, over long periods of time to result in macroevolution, the development of new species over typically long periods of time. Um, so macroevolution then proceeds by the process of speciation. Speciation is basically the splitting of one ancestral species into uh, multiple descendant species through time. Now, the more time that we have between the ancestral and descendant species, the more differences we typically see between them because it takes time for differences to evolve. So the more time we have, the more differences uh, can evolve. All right, so as an example of the process of speciation, we can look at um, our, our modern concept of the tree of life that you see here in this figure. This figure is showing you the three domains of life. So think about um, our taxonomic categories, right, for classification. We have domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. These are the three domains. Domain is the largest taxonomic category that we have. And you see we have domain eukarya, this is all the eukaryotic organisms. We have domain archaea, all bacterial or prokaryotes, and a second bacterial or prokaryotic domain, domain bacteria. Um, so pretty much domain bacteria contains all the, you know, run-of-the-mill bacteria we, we, we normally deal with. The archaeans are also referred to as the extremophiles. These are bacterial species that can live in very, very extreme environments uh, and that sort of thing. And then again, with eukarya, we have all the eukaryotic organisms, those composed of eukaryotic cells. You see we have the fungi, the animals, the land plants, that sort of thing, plus lots of other things. But the key point with this figure is that you can trace all of these domains back to a single common ancestor right, what's called the root of the tree. And so this root is, is hypothesized to represent a single species, probably an early bacterium or protobacterium, if you will, that ultimately speciated and gave rise to all three modern domains that we have today. And there's loads of evidence that suggests this is exactly what happened. Uh, and if true, <coughs> it means that Plants, animals, fungi, all the eukaryotes are related by common descent from a single ancestor, as are all of the prokaryotes. We're all related to one another uh, through common descent, uh, going back to about maybe 3.7, 3.8 billion years ago, at least as is currently suggested by the fossil record. Okay, so let's talk about um, what a phylogeny is. So let me just write this right here. This term phylogeny, you're going to see it quite a bit over the course of the semester. A phylogeny is nothing more than an evolutionary history. We typically depict phylogenies through evolutionary trees and that's exactly what we see here in this figure. This is an evolutionary tree. It's a phylogeny. Okay. So how do we reconstruct these phylogenies? Well, it, it can be challenging. It, it does require deductive logic. We have to sort of infer what happened in the past since we cannot observe it directly. It's already happened, and it happened typically in most cases prior to humans coming on the scene. So we did not observe these events directly. So phylogeny show us the pattern of evolution from the common ancestor to its descendant species. For example, who evolved first, um, you know, where anatomical or morphological features first appeared, and how they were passed down, etc. 
this is mostly achieved by studying modern species, but the fossil record does provide some very important information as well. All right, let's talk about um, taxonomy here a little bit, because taxonomy and uh, the development of phylogenies are, uh, in a modern sense, very, very closely intertwined, okay? So in the early to mid uh, 1700s, there was a Swedish botanist named Linnaeus, um, Carl von Linné, okay? And he developed a system of classification to name each species, uh, each known species, and place it within a biological context. And this uh, system of classification that Linnaeus gave us, all right, let me like write his name here actually. This is the Latinized form of his name. All right, so Carolus Linnaeus gave us what we call binomial nomenclature. In other words, naming or giving each species a unique two-part name, the binomial. Okay, so here we have our sort of um, modern representation of that. And by the way, let me just say beforehand, uh, this system is a hierarchical system where groups are nested within larger groups, which themselves are nested within yet larger groups. So we have, for example, genera um, nested within families, families within orders, orders within classes, classes within phyla, and so on up the line. So um, what I've done here is give you the classification system for um, cats, right? House cats. So first of all, we have domain. So domain eukarya, all right? That's one of our three domains we just looked at. Kingdom animalia. So the animals are a group within the eukaryotes, along with plants, fungi, and everything else. Phylum chordata a type of animal, the chordate animals. So the chordata is nested along with other phyla in the animal kingdom. Class mammalia, order carnivora, the carnivores, family felidae, genus felis, and species catus. So felis catus, this is the binomian. This is the unique two-part scientific name for the house cat. Um, <clears throat> now, notice that felis the genus is always capitalized. Caddis, the species name, is always lowercase. That is always the way it is. And when you write this out, if you write it out by hand, you underline it. If you type it out, you can either un underline it or more commonly put it in italics. But that's what you have to do. That's just convention. All right. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> what we have on the left are what are called the taxonomic categories. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, and so on. On the right, we have taxa. These are taxa. Eukarya is a taxon. Animalia is a taxon. The two of them together are taxa, plural. So the taxa are the specific names of the taxonomic categories. All right, it's important to keep those uh, differentiated or straight. All right. Now, these intermediate taxonomic categories that we have, that, that uh, we actually have in the system that aren't shown here, um, can provide more information. So we have eight major taxonomic categories here, domain through species, but there are actually a lot more. I think there are upwards of maybe 30 or so different taxonomic categories. Um, these are the eight primary ones, but there are intermediate taxonomic categories. For example, there are superfamilies, there are subfamilies, suborders, infraorders. Um, just all sorts of different intermediate categories that are sometimes used to describe relationships um, or to describe organisms with more precision. Okay, so sometimes you'll see more than just these eight primary taxonomic categories here. Okay, so let's go back to Linnaeus for a second. So uh, Linnaeus grouped organisms in categories based on similar anatomy or morphology. So we know what anatomy is Morphology is overall physical form, all right? Uh, generally, external features. Um, so this system of Linnaeus was, was meant by him to uncover what he called God's scheme of creation, right? He was trying to get into the mind of God to figure out what God was thinking when he developed or, or created these organisms. Um, it's important to recognize that although we still use Linnaeus' system today, his original system, as envisioned by him and developed by him, was not based on any sort of evolutionary framework. 
He was not an evolutionist at all. First of all, this was 100 years before Darwin, uh, but he was not thinking in terms of evolutionary relationships at all, okay? For example, Linnaeus grouped bats in with primates based on the presence of two nipples in both, right? He, he actually grouped them very closely together uh, in the same category because both bats and primates had two nipples. That was a, a morphological feature that he used to suggest that they should be put in the same bin, or the same category. Bats are no longer grouped with, with primates today. Okay, it's recognized that that two nipple condition evolved multiple times independently and therefore is not a reason to group bats with primates. Um, <clears throat> the thing about Linnaeus's system is that without an evolutionary framework, or in the sense that it lacked an evolutionary framework, um, these sort of pre-Darwinian classifications were not objective. Uh, they were based solely on the opinion of the, of the person, you know, doing the, cat, the categorization. Um, and also, it's important to recognize that that these classifications were sometimes based on similarities that were superficial only. Okay, you'll see more of what I mean about that here um, in a little bit. So. Linnaeus develops a system, <clears throat> and even given its shortcomings early on, in other words, not being based in evolutionary theory and that sort of thing, it's such a good system we actually still use it today. But we use a modified form of it. We use the form of it that now incorporates evolutionary theory, evolutionary thinking. Right. So, like I said, Darwin uh, publishes The Origin of Species in 1859, and that's sort of a watershed moment. It's an inflection point in terms of how classifications are done. In a pre-Darwinian view, closely related simply meant that two species shared similar characteristics. Post-Darwinian, closely related, meant that two species shared a recent common ancestor who also possessed those common features. So an analogy for that, pre-Darwinian, you could think of, you know, you and, um, you know, maybe somebody in your classroom who you've never met before and you are not related to, both have blue eyes. You would be considered closely related in a pre-Darwinian, strictly Linnaean context because you both share the blue eye condition. In a post-Darwinian view, maybe you and your sister or brother share blue eyes because your parents both have blue eyes. So you got blue eyes in a hereditary sense from your parents. That's what closely related in a post-Darwinian view means about two, with regard to two species. They share common features because they inherited those common features from their ancestor, okay? So very, very different way of viewing things post-Darwinian versus pre-Darwinian in terms of classification. So common features of species are inherited from ancestral species <clears throat> and are not bestowed upon them randomly by a creator. The pre-Darwinian view gave no explanation of why the features were similar other than, they, than that they were created that way. Well, that's a very unfulfilling, unsatisfying explanation. It doesn't explain anything. In the Darwinian view of descent from, from a common ancestor, that gives meaning to closely related. It means that two species are closely related because they share features in common with their ancestor, their common ancestor who gave rise to those two species. All right, for example, all vertebrates are related by common descent from the first vertebrate organism. That first vertebrate had a vertebral column, and all descendant species, i.e. all modern vertebrates, have a vertebral column in common because they got it from that common ancestor. Okay, <clears throat> so let's take a look at uh, Darwin's, one of Darwin's early illustrations of a phylogenetic um, tree, phylogenetic relationships. So what we have here is time on the y-axis, okay? and common ancestor on the x-axis. You see we have various common ancestors here, A through L, whatever these species might be, just A through L. And the distance along the x-axis represents the amount of divergence in form. <clears throat> so different angles of the branches reveal different rates of divergence. So for example, you could look at uh, this grouping right here. Notice that they're all pretty much vertical. In other words, there's not a lot of, if you look at this node here, and compared to this node, there's not a lot of distance between them on that x-axis. So that means that they are not very different in form. 
this means a very slow rate of evolution. Contrast that with what you see over here. Compare this node to this node. There's a large difference between them along the x-axis, so this represents a more rapid pace of evolutionary change, the development of, of different evolutionary features over uh, similar time, frame, time frames much more rapidly than what you might see here, for example. All right, <clears throat> so um, notice that all modern species, so if we look at uh, time 14 here, right, these are all the modern species that we see. Notice that they are all descended from ancestors A, F, and I. So A gives rise to all these modern species. F gives rise to that species only. I gives rise to these. Notice that B, C, D, E, for example, G, H, K, and L, they all go extinct. They all go along for some amount of time, but then that lineage goes extinct. That is common. We see that a lot in the fossil record. You'll see uh, lots of <coughs> fossil lineages that you're know, going along just fine. All of a sudden, you hit a layer of rock, and there's nothing left of that lineage above that rock layer, indicating that that lineage most likely went extinct. Uh, so this, this is common. It happens quite a bit. And so what we can say is that we have all these modern species here, but they're all descended from three different ancestors. All of these should have features in common because they got them from this ancestor, for example. And the same is true with the others, um, you know, F and I as well. Okay. <clears throat> so Linnaeus's original system of classification, um, if we do it correctly, actually reveals evolutionary history via its hierarchical nature. That's an important point. Remember that. Classification really re reveals phylogeny. Classification reveals evolutionary history. So now that we've incorporated evolutionary thinking, a post-Darwinian view, into Linnaeus's system, if we do our, if we reconstruct our tax taxonomies correctly, find a new species, figure out where it goes into the grand scheme of things of our modern taxonomy, if we do that correctly, the taxonomy that we've created will reveal the evolutionary history of that species and how it's related to other species, what its common ancestors likely to be, that sort of thing. That's the real beauty of modern taxonomy is that if we do it correctly, it shows us the evolutionary history of organisms. All right, so let's look at an example here. So this is a, um, another evolutionary history or phylogeny, uh, mostly for um, <clears throat> the animals, all right? So what you can see here is that we have a universal common ancestor. And we have, right off the bat, the bacteria, domain bacteria, splitting off from that. So that's one of our three domains, right? Then we have everything else being the animals. And then, well, the archaea splitting off here. So here we have domain archaea. And then we have, um, not the animals, I'm sorry, the eukaryotes, right? So we have domain eukarya from plants all the way up to unicellular eukaryotes domain bacteria, and domain archaea. So let's look and see um, how we sort of classify these organisms, right? Well, they're classified based on the development of, of novel or unique features. So here we have number one, feature number one, the origin of eukaryotes, right? A symbiotic bacterium becomes the mitochondria. So that differentiates all of the uniform or unicellular eukaryotes all, and all the way down to plants from the archaea and the bacteria. Why? Because that feature evolved after the archaea split off and after the bacteria split off. So they couldn't possibly have those features, right? That feature, um, symbiotic bacterium becomes the mitochondria, for example, was not in the pipeline when bacteria split off or when archaea split off. It evolved after that point, so only things that evolved later would have that characteristic. Characteristic number two, multicellularity, right here. Cell and tissue differentiation. Well, the unicellular eukaryotes, like the protists, for example, do not have multicellularity, but everything after, from fungi down to plants, do. Uh, let's go on a little bit further, go to number five, chordates. 
right? Notochord dorsal nerve cord. So that feature evolves here. All the groups of organisms before that, up to this node, would not have that feature. But everything beyond that point, so from the fishes all the way down to the tunicates, would have that feature. All right, let's go to number eight. What's that one? The amniotes. So development of the amniotic egg. In other words, an egg that has a waterproofing layer that allows the egg to be laid on land in very dry environments. So we see that right here. Well, the amniotes then are the reptiles, the birds, um, and the mammals. Now, even though mammals don't lay eggs, mostly they don't, uh, we still have amniotic, uh, the amniotic membrane uh, in the placenta. All right. So you can see how the amnion then is a feature that ties together this group of organisms to the exclusion of everything that evolved, that evolved before that. And the same is true with everything else, right? You can go down to the primates, for example, number 10. Primates, the primate condition evolved here, so everything after that should be primate to distinguish it from the other mammals, for example. So by looking at common features of modern organisms, we can reconstruct or sort of back calculate, if you will, what the evolutionary changes were that must have given rise to that modern condition. Okay, so this process then of sort of reconstructing evolutionary trees based on looking at extant or modern or living organisms is re referred to as inferring phylogenies. We're inferring what must have happened based on current evidence or the current condition. So measurement of the degree of similarity or difference between organisms should allow for reconstruction of the branching history that produced those taxa. And, and, and there's a major assumption here. It assumes, doing this assumes that species become progressively more different from one another through time. So if you have fewer differences, that should indicate the two species are relatively more closely related. If you have a lot of differences between two species, that again should indicate that they are more distantly related. They have a, more, an ancestor, a share a common ancestor further back in time. Again, this is because differences accumulate through time. All right, so as an example, um, characters are the, th are the physical characteristics of organisms that differ from species to species. So what you're seeing here are examples of Darwin's finches, okay? They differ in bill form, coloration, size, behavior, that sort of thing. So you can see differences in the bill form here between a large ground finch and maybe a, a medium ground finch. Uh, here you have an, a finch that uses its bill as a, to manipulate tools uh, and that sort of thing. Here you have what looks like a warbler finch. But the point is, is you see that a lot of similarity in overall body form because birds need a certain body form to be able to fly. It's the features that aren't necessarily needed for flight that are more malleable. Okay, more flexible in an evolutionary sense, like the beaks, for example, that can evolve for various uh, different types of food gathering or food utilization in different environments and whatnot. But these are all what we call phenotypic characteristics, right? Characteristics of the physical form that we can use to sort of <coughs> infer phylogeny or evolutionary history. Um, so, what you're looking at here in terms of, for example, the differences in morphology in the bills or coloration or, you know, scale pattern on the feet, if you can see that, whatever, these are called character states. And, oh, sorry, I'll go back for a second. And um, character states are nothing more than different forms of a character, right? So let me write this down. Character states. Character states are just different forms of a character. So color, for example, blue versus gray. Those are two different character states of the character of color. So blue is one state, gray is another. Wing morphology, say in fruit flies, straight versus curly. Those are two different character states of the character of wing morphology. Size, large versus small, different character states again. We can also have different character states in our DNA sequences. So here we're talking about genotypic, right? Genotypic character states. So the genotype type is, is the DNA sequence, basically. So DNA sequences, or differences in them, can be used to infer phylogeny as well. We know that we have four bases, right? A, T, C, 
and G, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. Um, you compare sequences for the same gene from two different species, and if you see differences in those, then those differences are different character states. So maybe you have ATCG as one sequence, compare another species, and you have AACG. Well, that difference there is a difference in character state. Okay, a difference in character state. Um, the nice thing about DNA sequences is that they're far less ambiguous than phenotypic characters often are. In terms of, of you know, classifying species and, and inferring phylogenies based on phenotypic characteristics, physical character, character states like color, that's ambiguous. That can very often be interpreted different ways by different researchers. One person might say that a subtle difference in shading between two species represents, represents different character states. Another person might not be able to see that color shading difference very well or as well, and they might, as, they might classify it as not a difference in character state. But a difference in a genotypic character state, like a nucleotide base pair sequence, that's not ambiguous. That is clear cut, black and white, straight up. Okay, so that's why today a lot of the, um, in fact, probably mostly all of the uh, phylogenetic inference that goes on when we find a new species or discover a new species is genetic. Take DNA sequences, compare them to existing to sequences from existing closely related species, and find out where they sort of sort of slot into that evolutionary tree. All right. This is another reason why DNA comparisons are so useful. Um, in many cases, you have <clears throat> maybe fairly closely related species that look dramatically different from one another from a morphological standpoint, okay? So what you have on, on the left here is a species of plant that's parasitic, but it has some of the largest flowers or possibly the largest flower of any other plant in the world. Um, this plant on the right, you wouldn't know it, but is a very closely related um, species to this species. They're very closely related genetically, but morphologically, you would never know that because they've, they've evolved such extreme morphological differences that it obscures what actually is a fairly close evolutionary relationship. Genotypic inference here using DNA sequences reveals that similarity and tells us that despite what the morphology says, they're actually very closely related. Um, here we have a species of fungus that is um, uh, grown by um, uh, certain species of ants in uh, South America, for example. They grow it a, as um, a food source. Uh, it's very closely related to a species of mushroom but you would never know that based on physical appearance and morphology alone. It's only DNA evidence that reveals that information for us. And so that's why this is yet another reason why DNA uh, analysis uh, for phylogenetic inference um, is so useful today because it's unambiguous, right? The, the extreme differences that we see here would lead, could lead a, a researcher way off the, uh, of the, the correct path because of morphological difference alone when really they should be saying that these species are very closely related. Okay, <clears throat> so character states are typically described um, on evolutionary trees with either zero or one, okay? So <clears throat> zero refers to the ancestral form and one refers to the new form, or what we call the derived form. So first of all, let me just write this down. This word derived is important when you're gonna see it. Derived means new and ancestral means old or more appropriately original, right? Uh, the, the original form. So. Um, <clears throat> zero is ancestral and one is new or derived. Now, a lot of times what you see in terms of notation on evolutionary trees is that a character could be labeled with letters. So you could have some character, we'll call it character A, and the way you would indicate it as ancestral or derived is as A0 or A1, right? So A0, some character state A, character A and it's the ancestral form. A1 
character A, the derived form, okay? And also we have tick marks, little horizontal lines along the branches in a tree that indicate a change in character state, say from zero to one. So maybe you'll have uh, an evolutionary tree, something like this, and you'll have a tick mark right there. And so maybe you had uh, a zero here, and this species still has a zero, but here we have a switch from a zero to a one, so now we have a one and a one. And so this represents a shift in character state from a zero to a one, so everybody beyond that who evolved later should have character state a one. All right, <clears throat> now let's define some very important terms here. Now, these terms that I'm going to write down are, in many cases, they sound alike, but they have quite different meanings, and it can be a little bit confusing. So you need to work on getting the, the definitions of these terms down. So first term we have is apomorphy, apomorphy. An apomorphy is a derived character, derived character, right? Next we have what's called a plesiomorphy. A plesiomorphy is an ancestral character. So very, very basic here. Apomorphy is a new or derived character. Plesiomorphy is an ancestral or old character. Now, we need to talk about these in terms of whether or not they are if they're shared by multiple species or, or whatnot. So two more specific terms related to these are synapomorphy. That's an A there, sorry, synapomorphy. A synapomorphy is a shared derived character. In other words, if we have two descendant species from a common ancestor and they, have, they both share a new feature not present in the common ancestor, then that new feature is a synapomorphy. It's shared between two or more descendant species and it's new. It's something that the ancestor does not have. All right, related to that, we have what's called simply, whoops, sorry, try that again, simplesiomorphy. A simplesiomorphy is a shared ancestral character. So two or more descendant species from a common ancestor have a certain feature in common, and the ancestor also has it, then that is a shared ancestral character, okay? <clears throat> shared ancestral character. Two or more descendant species have a feature, but it's also present in their common ancestor. Shared ancestral character. All right, now another very important term uh, or concept actually that we need to cover is that of a monophyletic clay, uh, group. This is also referred to as a clade, okay? Um, why is it called a clade? Well, the process of reconstructing evolutionary trees is also referred to as cladistics. Okay, don't worry about that too much right now. We'll see more about it later on. But a monophyletic group is defined as all species, so all species, SPP is species, um, derived from a single common ancestor. The same common ancestor, okay? So a monophyletic grouping of organisms is a grouping on an evolutionary tree that represents all species derived from the same common ancestor. So as an example, let's say we have a tree that looks sort of something like this, okay? And um, we could say that this grouping right here is a monophyletic um, no, I did that wrong, sorry. This grouping here is a monophyletic grouping because all of these species represented here by the twigs or the, the, the tips of these branches, the twigs, are descended from that same common ancestor, 
All right, we're gonna see a lot more about this as we, as we go along here. Okay, some additional terms that are important for helping us to ultimately be able to reconstruct evolutionary trees. Um, we have characters that are referred to as homoplasius, so homoplasius characters. These are characters that are the result of um, what's known as convergent evolution. Okay, convergent evolution, or also evolutionary reversal. All right. The point here is that there are characters that, that two species can share or have that if you compare them to each other, those characters seem to suggest an evolutionary relationship where none actually exists. All right? A great example of that is the body form of, let's say, sharks and whales. Um, so think about killer whales, right? <coughs> killer whales and sharks actually look very similar. They have dorsal fins, caudal fins, they have that torpedo-shaped body, all that sort of thing. But whereas sharks are fish, um, whales are mammals. So they're, they're not in the same group of organisms at all, right? They're entirely different lineages of vertebrate animals. But if you're taking a sort of pre-Darwinian view of things, where you're just classifying organisms based on morphology alone, and you're comparing a shark to a killer whale to a leopard, you are probably going to include the shark and the killer whale in the same grouping and have the leopard in an entirely different group. But that would be wrong because we know that the leopard and the orca, the killer whale, are actually mammals and are more closely related to each other than either one is to the shark. So you've got this overall body form, for example, what's called a fusiform or torpedo-shaped body form that leads you to believe that the orca and the shark are closely related when they're not. So what's going on there? Well, that fusiform or torpedo-shaped body form in the orca is an example of evolutionary reversal. We know that whales evolved from tetrapod mammals, terrestrial four-limbed mammals, going back to maybe 50, 60 million years ago. Uh, they represent a group of mammals that had at one point been entirely terrestrial, but moved back to an aquatic and or marine existence, uh, like modern hippos are thought to be doing, like um, you know beavers uh, and otters are thought to be doing uh, currently. So that's an example, that body form, similarity between sharks and whales, is an example of a homoplasius character. It's a character situation or state that leads you to believe that there's an evolutionary relationship when there's not, okay? So when we're reconstructing phylogenies, we have to be on the lookout for that sort of thing because it can lead us to construct incorrect phylogenies, grouping whales and sharks together um, to the exclusion of leopards, for example. So, how do we then reconstruct our phylogenies? Well, we don't want to use homoplasius characters. They can lead us down the wrong road, as I've just said. We want to use shared derived characters. That's what we need to use, all right? So phylogenies are constructed then with shared derived characters, but only when they are uniquely derived. In other words, not a result of convergent evolution or reversal. Right? We have to look at these shared derived characters and identify any of them that may be homoplasies. So if you look at the ancestor to sharks and killer whales, you can find a common ancestor who did not have the features that the sharks and the killer whales share. Right? So though that fusiform body shape is a shared derived character, but it's not uniquely derived. It evolved twice. It evolved once on the line to sharks and once on the line to uh, whales after they had already split off from their common ancestor. So things can evolve multiple times independently, and in that case, they would not be uniquely derived. Okay, they can suggest evolutionary relationships where there is none. Okay, so the biologist who developed um, uh, basically our modern way of reconstructing phylogenies Okay. what is called phylogenetic 
systematics or aka cladistics his name was uh, Willy Hennig so he was a German uh, entomologist he developed a system of phylogenetics systematics in the 1960s called cladistics okay and Hennig said that uh, organisms may be similar because they can share um, uniquely derived character states. They could be, appear similar because they share ancestral character states. Or they could appear similar because they have homoplasious character states that were a result of convergent evolution or reversal. But importantly, of those three, uniquely derived character states, ancestral character states, and homoplasious character states, Hennig said that only uniquely derived character states can be used to construct clades, okay, um, or phylogenies. In other words, uniquely derived character states are the only ones that provide useful information for correctly reconstructing phylogenies or evolutionary histories. Okay, so let's take a look at an example here. So here we see a phylogeny of the vertebrates. So um, take a look, we have a common ancestor down here at the base, okay, and then we have uh, the bony fishes split off very early on, we have the lung fishes a little bit later, then we have the frogs and salamanders, you know, the amphibians, so on. Uh, we have a few features here that are important. Evolution of the tetrapod limb, okay, forelimb condition, evolution of the amniotic egg, and evolution of feathers. <clears throat> so in this phylogeny, Tetrapods, amniotes, and birds are all considered to be a monophyletic clades. Okay, they're all mon monophyletic clades. So tetrapods, why is that? It's everything from the lungfishes over to the birds. We can trace them all back to this common ancestor. So a monophyletic clade is all descendant species and their common ancestor. Now, if you go up a little bit, here you have the amniotes. So the amniotic egg appears at this point, everything beyond that, so the mammals all the way over to the birds should be the amniotes. So it's a more specific, okay, a more specific clade than the tetrapods, which has an earlier ancestor. Go up further, birds, right, feathers, the ostrich, the eagle, the crow, etc. All of them share feathers in common, and so they are a yet newer, uh, evolutionary clade, a newer uh, monophyletic clade. So monophyletic, all existing species and their common ancestor, okay? <clears throat> so in each case, each of these new features evolved only once, okay? That's an important point. Now, there are two problems with Willie Hennig's system here, right? First of all, how does one determine if a character state is derived or ancestral. Secondly, how can we know if a character state is uniquely derived or homoplasious? In other words, how do we know it evolved once versus it evolving multiple times independently? Right, that's the major question there. Well, we have this concept called parsimony, or what is sometimes referred to as maximum parsimony. Parsimony is a very useful concept. You can apply it to lots of things, not just development of evolutionary histories. You can apply it to your logical reasoning process when you're evaluating, you know, I don't know, uh, a timely thing today is claims of election fraud, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> parsimony basically uh, says that when you have to make assumptions, okay, you don't know everything, you have to make assumptions, simpler assumptions, simpler hypotheses are preferable to and more likely to be correct than more complicated hypotheses. In other words, hypotheses that require fewer assumptions are far more likely to be correct than hypotheses requiring more assumptions. This concept of maximum parsimony is also known as Occam's razor, okay? And it will open the world to you if you, if you use this line of reasoning in your daily interactions with others, the media, you know, when you're evaluating claims, whatever. All right, so this is called the law of parsimony or Occam's, Occam's razor. Again, 
when you're confronted with, let's say, let's, let's say two competing hypotheses about something, the simpler hypothesis is more likely to be correct. That's the main idea with this. And it's very, very useful for uh, helping us to reconstruct evolutionary trees. Another way to say it, the simplest explanation is most likely the correct explanation. Um, the reason why we call it the Occam's razor is because it dates back to the 14th century English logician William of Occam, who sort of developed this, this idea, this logical reasoning idea known as parsimony. Okay, <clears throat> so let's take a look at how we can apply, apply this. All right. So here we have two different evolutionary trees, right? These are two different hypotheses, hypothetical phylogeny A and accepted phylogeny B. So in other words, we, this is the one that's currently accepted. We feel this one's correct, all right? But what we're doing here is trying to basically reconstruct the evolutionary history of these vertebrate animals. So frogs, lizards, birds, humans, rats, monkeys, and so on. Okay, <clears throat> if we look at the character key over here on the right, we see the development of bipedalism. You can see these as our hash marks here, right? Hair, milk, the diaphragm, molar teeth, and three middle ear bones. Okay, so let's look at the accepted phylogeny first. All right, <clears throat> we know that birds are bipedal organisms. We also know that humans are bipedal organisms. So if this phylogeny is correct, we have to put bipedalism twice, once here and once here. And I'll explain why that is in a minute. Now look at the other characters. So hair, milk, right? Presence of a diaphragm below the rib cage for breathing, molar teeth, um, three middle ear bones. Those are all features of mammals specifically, okay? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six different changes here. With one of them, development of bipedalism, shown twice, as if it's evolved two separate times independently, once in birds and once in the primates. Okay, now <clears throat> we could also draw that tree this way. There are lots of different ways you could draw trees. You can, you can, you know, flip these um, different things around 180 degrees, rotate them left and right, swat, uh, swat, switch out their positions, that kind of thing. There are lots of different ways to reconstruct these trees. Each one is a hypothesis. We want to find the simplest one. So let's look at this one. This is another way to do it. We know that birds and humans share a feature in common, right? Bipedalism. Okay. We could put birds and humans in the same group here and separate humans from other mammals like rats and monkeys. If we do that, however, that does satisfy the one issue of, of just having um, bipedalism evolve once because it's in the common ancestor of both birds and humans, so it's in the pipeline, they both get it from that same common ancestor. But in doing so, that means that characters two through six, so hair through three middle ear bones, have to evolve once independently for humans, and the same group of five characters has to evolve a second time independently for the other mammals. Now, which of these two is more likely? In this case, the first one, the accepted phylogeny, we have that suite of features evolving one time only. In this other competing hypothesis, we have that same suite of features evolving twice. So ask yourself, is it more reasonable that a single feature evolves twice or an entire suite of five different features evolves two times independently in exactly the same way? This is the most parsimonious change, or most par parsimonious tree. It requires the fewest number of changes. This one requires one, two, three, four, five, six, seven changes. This one requires one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven changes. So eleven here, seven there. This is the most parsimonious tree. That is the idea or the concept behind maximum parsimony. Okay, so it's important to recognize then that phylogenetic trees are hypotheses that have to be tested, okay? That's all they are is hypotheses that we test. Testing usually involves phylogenetic inference with data from other sources like molecular data, fossil evidence, morphological data, embryological or developmental evidence. What are the patterns of development um, in the egg or the womb, right? Similarities and differences there. There are lots of different lines of evidence for validating these evolutionary trees. 
And the nice thing is, is that when you hit on a tree that is likely to be correct, usually your multiple lines of evidence corroborate that. All right, we see that here. So what we have here is a vertebrate phylogeny based on morphology that's also corroborated by a phylogeny based on independent molecular data. So here on the left in blue, we have a vertebrate phylogeny based on morphology alone, outward physical appearance. You can see the relationships, right, of all these different species. Here in, in red on the right, we have a phylogeny based on DNA sequence. And if you look at the overall pattern of branching and the sequence of the species, you see it's roughly the same. There is one major difference, and that is what's known as the turtle problem. Turtles are sort of a weird group. Uh, morphologically, uh, turtles actually appear to be um, a very ancient group of reptiles that shares a much older common ancestor with modern reptiles. D and this is because of differences in skull features and, and various other things, the presence of the shell, that kind of thing. Um, DNA evidence, however, puts turtles in a group with crocodiles and birds as having shared a more recent common ancestor. So there's a little bit of question here about turtles, but you see everything else pretty much lines up, whether your phylogeny is morphology-based or it's, or it's DNA sequence-based, uh, okay? And if you did, um, you know, a third phylogeny based on uh, embryological evidence or fossil evidence, you would see that they, that they agree with these two here as well, again, with the exception of the turtles, most likely. So when you have a, a hypothesis that is supported by multiple lines of evidence, that's always a good thing. That is strong evidence that you've got that phylogeny generally correct. Okay, that's where we're gonna stop for um, chapter one, or chapter two, rather. I'll finish the uh, video lecture for that in a, 